Welcome back, everyone, to World Civilizations II. Um, since 1500, I am once again Dr. Ross. You get me one more time after this before Dr. Haynes takes back over uh, next week. And I'm going to continue our discussion of, uh, in many respects, the age of revolutions. We began a week and a half ago with the American Revolution, French Revolution, Haitian Revolution, and today we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution. And as I explained in my um, announcement uh, laying out what we're going to be doing this week, one way of thinking about it is that we're switching from a set of political and social revolutions to an economic revolution that, of course, you know, of course, would have political and social effects. Now, thinking about the Industrial Revolution in light of the American, French, and Haitian revolutions makes sense, not simply because they're essentially simultaneous processes all happening in the late 18th century. So America, France, and Haiti all happening in the late 18th century and the Industrial Revolution happening in Britain, late 18th century. But because they are part of a single process, a single, the emergence of a single ideology that would dominate European society and today dominates global society, that I'm arguing that we need to consider the relationships between these political, social, and economic revolutions that began in the 18th century because fundamentally they're all part of the same process. And that process is the emergence of what we call liberalism. And that's where I'm going to start my lecture uh, today, but the idea of liberalism. In this course, we don't use the term liberal the way most Americans use the term. So it's important that you understand what it means to say that this week we are going to describe the expansion and creation of notions of liberal economics and their effect on the spread of industrial technology throughout the world. By liberal in this class, we mean the various kinds of common ideals that bind the American, uh, French, Haitian, and Industrial Revolutions together. And actually, in many respects, Dr. Haynes and I have been describing the emergence of political liberalism through the case of our three revolutions that we've already covered without telling you. Liberalism in this class simply means those ideals that bind these revolutions together. Freedom of speech is a liberal idea. The right to vote is a liberal idea. The freedom of religious expression is a liberal idea. The political ideals represented by the, by the French, American, and Haitian revolutions are, in many respects, that which constituted the idea of liberalism. Think about the root of the term, liberal, liberty, freedom. The attempt by all these revolutionaries to grant as much freedom to as many people as possible. Supposedly. We've already seen many of those limitations, the way it did not necessarily extend to workers, to women, and to people of color. But nonetheless, the groundwork was laid, as I argued in my lecture on the Haitian Revolution, for a gradual expansion of liberal ideas around politics that would eventually include all of us in one political process. Liberals are bound together by a shared faith in the Enlightenment. The reason they come to believe that we should grant freedom to all people is that they believe that people are fundamentally reasonable that they can use their powers of rational, rational thought to come to concrete solutions. We give people the right to free speech, not simply because we think it's a good thing, but, we think, but because liberals believe that by granting people the right to speak, we will come to better solutions and conclusions about where the world needs to be. Liberals, therefore, believe in progress. They believe in progress in both political sense, gradually achieving the greatest freedom for the greatest number of people, but also in an economic sense, that we will gradually increase and uh, uh, the, the um, mm, we will gradually increase the wealth, not simply of nations, but through, of the entire world by virtue of our ability to come to concrete decisions. 
So when I use the term liberal, and I'm going to be using it quite a bit in today's lecture on Thursday, I'm not referring to Democrats. I'm referring to both Democrats and Republicans, because fundamentally both political parties in the contemporary US share these values. The belief in the right to vote, the belief in political progress, and the belief, just for, as examples, in the right to free speech. Put simply, my three-part definition of what makes a liberal. Liberals believe that individuals are rational, that they are reasonable, and that they fundamentally desire freedom, liberty, the root of the word. They believe in progress. They believe that society itself can be improved. That once we use our powers of deduction, our powers to reason, we will come to solutions to make society better. Therefore, all history is the story of progress. You can see this in the French and American revolutions. The Enlightenment thinkers that gave birth to the revolutions believed that by reconsidering what is possible in the political realm, they could make their societies better. Today, we turn to the ways in which these liberal ideas become applied to the economy. And I will argue that it's liberal notions of, of, of the economy that both justify and help explain both the positive and the negative outcomes of the process of industrialization. A process that I think most historians would argue we still live in under today. So in order to get at some of those ideas, we had you read an excerpt um, of Adam Smith's most famous work, uh, The Wealth of Nations. Adam Smith was an Enlightenment philosopher. He was Scottish. And he was devoted to understanding the way in which modern economic systems work. And with asserting what the best kind of economic system would be. In other words, he believed that by using the power of reasonable thought, reason, uh, rational thought, he could come to a conclusion about the best way to organize an economy. Adam Smith explicitly argued against the idea of mercantilism that Dr. Haynes introduced to you a couple lectures ago. Remember, mercantilists argued that nations should control their economy. They should maintain a managed economy in order to uh, increase the finite amount of wealth available in the world. Adam Smith said that's incorrect. Adam Smith said we should actually allow a free market to determine the ways in which both individuals and nations interacted in the economy. Why did he believe this? Because he didn't believe that the wealth available in the world was finite. He believed it was essentially infinite. That by allowing and encouraging liberty in the economic realm, we would find ways of gradually increasing the amount of wealth available to all of us, right? The quote unquote wealth of nations. So in your reading, excuse me, we had you, um, we had you focus on the section of the wealth of nations, note the date, quite easy to remember, wealth of nations published 1776, uh, that emphasized the division of labor. And Smith argued that what was happening in the economies he was observing was a gradual conclusion that by dividing up the responsibilities of an economy amongst those most able and willing to complete a certain aspect of it, one would become more efficient. And that increased efficiency, perhaps it takes place within an individual industry, gradually increases the available capital, the available wealth available to everyone who participates. The implication in Will Smith's argument is that by undoing restrictions on labor practices, certain industries will come to better arrangements than previously existed. By granting freedom to industry to develop the best practice for being the most efficient, we will see an increase in wealth that is essentially unlimited. And Smith argued that the process through which the free market worked to accomplish this amazing feat 
is through what he called the invisible hand. So this section of Adam Smith's text is not in the selection we had you read for today, but it's worth pointing out as one of the most important passages in econ political economy ever written. By directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of the greatest value, he, the industrialist, intends only his own gain. Smith argues in just that clause that we should allow the owners of industry to do what is best for their own industry. Adam Smith is essentially saying that we should remove obstacles to the leaders of industry from doing what is best for them. In doing so, in following his own self-interest, the industrialist is led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. Adam Smith, godfather of the free market, is arguing that by eliminating restrictions on trade, on industry, one will allow industrialists and capitalists to promote their own self-interest. And the reason we should allow these men to do so is not because those individuals become richer, but because all of society will gradually benefit. Put simply, Smith, as a liberal, argues for economic liberty, for free markets, for freedom of trade, for free trade. And he does so not simply to enrich those who engage in that trade, but to engage, uh, but to enrich the entire nation and eventually the world. Free trade, freedom of the economy, free markets, that to Adam Smith is what explains the immense growth that he was only beginning to witness in his own home uh, country of the United Kingdom. And indeed, in many respects, he was right. He predicted that by removing uh, obstacles to free trade, we would see an immense increase in wealth, in economic activity, and in industrial output. So this chart uh, traces global gross domestic product um, from 1400 to the present day. Um, if you look at, we want, right here is Western Europe, right around the early 19th century, what we call industrial takeoff. The Industrial Revolution, the removal of these, um, these fetters around industry enables the economies of Western Europe to essentially produce growth that has not stopped. The mercantilists were wrong. Wealth is not finite. It is infinite. It is infinite. The result, the Industrial Revolution. The result, not simply growth and wealth, absolute growth and wealth. Smith was absolutely right that that would occur, but also in inequality. Who will benefit the most, even as society as a whole becomes more wealthy? As we will see, some people will benefit far more than others. The question that faces us today is to what extent do we continue to allow that to occur? To what extent must we allow it to occur in order to maintain the continual growth that so determines the stability of global societies today. Another con that's the consequence I'll, I'll deal with today. Another consequence, one that I will deal with on Thursday, are more new forms of international inequality. What happens if you construct a society around the notion of the free market and free trade? But you encounter another society that doesn't want to engage in free trade, or in trade at all. And if you could think back to our early lectures, you might already be wondering about a particular country that was not so interested in trade, that of China. 
And as we will see, as the notion of free trade, as it becomes increasingly necessary to the prosperity of first Great Britain and then the Western world more, more, more broadly, they will decide that it is in their self-interest to force other countries to engage in trade with them. So if one form of inequality occurs on the ground in each individual nation as wealth is in, unevenly distributed, another form of inequality exists internationally as powerful industrializing countries begin the process of forcing formerly dominant nations to engage with them, whether they like it or not, what we call gunboat diplomacy, the subject of Thursday's lecture. Um, and then finally, a final consequence, the subject of Dr. Haynes's lecture next week that I will not go into uh, today, um, the rise of socialism. If liberalism, uh, I guess I will, I will introduce it at least briefly. If liberalism emphasizes freedom and equality to some extent, socialism emphasizes equality and, li and liberty to some extent. The response to the notion that we just need to give people freedom to engage in their own self-interest by some members of Western society say no. That is leading to, a for to forms of inequality that are not tolerable, that are not tolerable. And socialism, the dominant opponent of the idea of liberalism through the course of especially the 20th century, will come to very different conclusions about how best to organize an industrial society. So, um, to sum up my introduction, the Industrial Revolution in many respects is both a cause and a result yeah, cause and a result of the notion of economic liberalism. Economic liberalism, coming from Adam Smith, means the free market. It means providing for as much liberty, liberalism, to economic actors, whether that's an individual, a business, or a nation. In doing so, liberals argue correctly that the world's wealth would increase and that people overall would be better off. Adam Smith was right. What liberals were willing to tolerate, however, was increasing inequality as that wealth increased. So even though everyone will do better, the divide between the richest and the poorest would only expand. And in response, in response, nations, China, and individuals, socialists, will have to decide what kind of vision they want for the future uh, going forward. Okay, so that's my introduction to the next three lectures, most particularly this lecture. Um, let's talk about the Industrial Revolution. First, a definition. What do I mean when I say the Industrial Revolution? I've already given you a sense. The Industrial Revolution is the moment of takeoff, economic takeoff, that began in the late 18th and accelerated in the early 19th century. First in Great Britain, the place I'm going to focus on for much of this lecture, and then in the rest of the Western world, next in France, in Germany, in the United States, Japan. But there are some comments to the Industrial Revolution we specifically want to focus on in order to understand that. Three-part definition, therefore. First, the Industrial Revolution means mechanization. Beginning in the late 18th and into the early 19th century, we uh, our Western society is increasingly replaced human physical labor power with that of machines. Industrialization means, first, the mechanization of labor. Now, I do not want to imply that that occurred quickly, that it occurred throughout society all at once, that it occurred evenly, but it is the most obvious component of the Industrial Revolution. I'll show some examples in a moment. The second aspect of my definition of the Industrial Revolution, and note uh, for your IDs, if we provide Industrial Revolution, we would want to see these three parts. Capitalism. Related to my introduction on liberalism, 
The Industrial Revolution entailed not simply mechanization, but the emergence of new relationships between those who owned capital and those who worked. The emergence of a new economic system that was based in the mobilization of capital, money, funds, banks, and on mobilizing labor power. And the emergence of conflicts that would exist between those who represented both sides. Dr. Haynes will talk about this aspect a little bit more next week. Third component is the way, of my definition, is the way that industrialization changed the ways in which Western society really understood itself. Indu industry itself takes on a new kind of character and becomes newly important to Western society. There is a shift, in other words, in our relationship to the economy that makes human beings more like economic actors, or at least seen and perceived to be economic actors in new ways. Industry itself, as a way of kind of illustrating what I mean, changes meaning. Before the 18th century, the very word industry was really a human quality. It was a quality that one could have. You can still see the, the tone of that term, and, or that this, you're a very industrious person. Industry was something that a person could have. Now it's an economic system. And so Western society in particular begins to measure human worth not on the basis of whether an individual has an industrial character, but on your value as a kind of component of an industrial economic system. We lose a bit, in other words, of the humanity of our very society. So my three-part definition, mechanization, the replacement of human power with machine power. Second, the emergence of capitalism, new relationships between labor and capital based on the free market. And third, a cultural shift, whereby we emphasize the, our economic relationships over that of our human relationships. That's a bit of a, a polemic, a <laughs> polemic component to the definition. So, what caused the Industrial Revolution? I'm not going to go into all the causes of the Industrial Revolution, but I will go into more than you probably want me to. Um, first cause, the existence of natural resources within Great Britain. Actually, let me, let me actually back up. The reason why it's important to think about causes is that the Industrial Revolution could have happened in a lot of different places, but it doesn't. It happens in one place. Literally, one place. It starts in England. It starts in Great Britain. And so it's only in Great Britain where all of these causes existed at one and the same time. And that's why it's relatively worth, uh, relatively important to spend some time on. Okay, so, excuse me. Uh, first cause, the existence of natural resources within the island of Great Britain. Um, here we think of um, excuse me, in particular, as this map uh, shows, coal. I mean, first forest, wood, and then coal. The existence of coal, which, as we continue to live with, um, will be the engine of industrialization, a new, more powerful fuel source that existed in great abundance with, uh, in the island of uh, Great Britain. The Industrial Revolution will allow the British to go deeper into coal mines than ever before, to extract coal at a rate that they previously were unable to do. And that coal will power the railroads and the factories that themselves will grant Great Britain its industrial might. Second cause within Great Britain, an agricultural revolution that had already begun in the early 18th century, maybe uh, really a little bit earlier, and had only continued to pace into the late 18th century. This map 
shows the process of enclosure within Great Britain within the 17, oh, excuse, yeah, 1700s. Enclosure refers to the elimination of common lands that could be used to graze one's individual uh, livestock or to grow a small plot of land and instead give them to rich landowners who could more efficiently um, create large-scale agricultural enterprises. This process of enclosure, the elimination of the public lands, and the creation of private large farms increased the agricultural uh, production of Great Britain and enabled much richer landowners than before to intensify their use of the land, to increasingly reclaim the land, and commercialize agriculture more broadly. This was important for a number of reasons. The greater food supply overall meant that you needed less people working the farms. And once less people are working the farms, then that's more people who can move to the cities and work in the factories. The early workforce of Great Britain, in other words, were those driven out of agriculture by the increasing efficiency and productivity of private landowners. The agricultural revolution was also significant to the development of, industrial revolution, uh, of, of the Industrial Revolution in Great Britain, because those private agricultural uh, owners, farmers, would be the first investors in industry in Great Britain. And indeed, that's our third cause. Britain had a sufficiently high number of people with the wealth and willingness to invest their excess profits, capital, in new and innovative ventures. Britain was somewhat unique for Western European powers where the nobility, for instance, was willing to invest in industry, to get involved in work, in making stuff. In France, the nobility had no interest in that. They were perfectly satisfied with doing what they had done for centuries. The British, that was not the case. The investment of capital provides the initial investment that would enable the emergence of large-scale manufacturing in Britain before anyone else. We're pointing out, I have this image of the Bank of England. You need a strong and stable financial system in order to ensure that all this investment will be well managed. And outside the Netherlands, the British had the most advanced banking system in the world. Now, the emergence of agriculture, or the, the development of agriculture, the emergence of a new investing class able to put their money where their mouths are, were, and, uh, uh, and create new industries, would have been useless without, without places to sell and buy goods. The Industrial Revolution right, depends on a free market, and a market implies trade. And what Britain had, especially after the Seven Years' War, was access to markets. Was access to markets. Britain's integration, and indeed most uh, fullest integration compared to its European neighbors, within a global economic system based around the Atlantic Ocean, enabled it not simply to have the kind of wherewithal to create new goods, but to sell them. So here in this map, manufactured goods created in England, being sold in Africa for slaves, but also in the New World, both before and after independence. That in then um, encourages more investment and greater trade overall. The expansion of the colonies provide new markets, and the elimination of tariffs and taxes within, these within the system provides the opportunity for Britain to trade back and forth. Note what that implies. The American Revolution was good for business. Right? The American Revolution was sparked over taxes. Well, once those taxes are gone, 
It simply encourages more trade between the two places and increases capital investment and the ability to buy and sell between them overall. Granted, I guess you think this. One other point, one other point about this map. I'm using it to introduce my last cause, or excuse me, second to last cause of the Industrial Revolution. Growing markets, places to buy and sell. You can't have an industrial revolution if you're not having, if you don't have a place to sell your stuff. It's useless. But this chart also represents something else that Dr. Haynes lectured on: the international slave trade. The emergence of industrial industrialization in Great Britain occurred on the backs of enslaved Africans. Industrial industrialization depended on slave labor. So for all the talk of freedom and free markets and uh, free labor, fundamentally industrial revolution depends on systems of unfreedom, slavery. And that's an important point. Historians used to argue that the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain despite the existence of slavery. That in fact, perhaps, the cotton plantations over here providing the material to make new textiles over here would have been more efficient with the system of free labor. That's not what historians argue anymore. That it was in fact the system of slavery in the American South, for instance, that provided the engine for industrialization so do not think that slavery was incidental to the lives you live today. It was fundamental to it. Finally, last cause of the Industrial Revolution, population. Who's going to buy your stuff if you don't have enough people? Who's going to work the factories if you don't have enough people? The Industrial Revolution was in part caused by the beginning of a population growth that really has not stopped. Right? The key for cause is this little bit of population growth that occurred just before the Industrial Revolution. Um, the Industrial Revolution, of course, would then accelerate that growth to untold numbers and would provide the ability for us to feed all these people that we previously thought we would not be able to. Population growth before the Industrial Revolution was in part uh, due to changing fertility practices having fewer children, but children who lived longer, for instance, that would then be accelerated by developments within medicine, hygiene, and that sort of thing. But again, if you don't have people, you don't have a market. And population growth provided the market. If you don't have people, you don't have labor. And population growth provided the labor. So, in case, you know, you're watching this video and you're like, oh, I, I'm gonna have to rewind. Very briefly, our causes, natural resources, agricultural revolution, availability of capital, emergence of global markets, and finally, population growth. So, what did industrialization actually look like? What did it entail? Um, if I say industrial revolution in an ID or in an essay question, you say textiles, you say clothing. The first place that industrialization took place, the first place the process of industrialization began was in the textile industry, the clothing industry. And therefore, the first inventions that would really revolutionize the manufacture of goods are related to textiles, to the growth of industry. Uh, worth pointing out uh, briefly, we're not covering much Indian history in this class, but um, one reason Britain was able to do this is that they purposefully destroyed the, kind of, or the textile industry in India in order to become the market, the place people needed to buy their textiles. So when Adam Smith says free market, Free market for me, not for thee. Right. The spinning jenny, invented in 1764, allowed uh, um, weavers to 
produce more thread, or uh, excuse me, to produce more, yeah, more thread at a time. You take individual strands, and rather than using a single spinning wheel, you can produce at a much faster rate, right? Think of my first part of my definition, mechanization. Similarly, the invention of the cotton gin by Eli Whitney in 1793 allowed people, uh, those who picked cotton to remove the seeds using the machine rather than by hand, vastly increasing the rate at which cotton producers, in particular the American South, could provide the very materials necessary to spit into thread. Note, you know, I'm going to emphasize this because it's important. Who's picking cotton to supply the textile mills in Britain? It's enslaved peoples in the American South. The cotton gin, in fact, probably extends the lifespan of the slave system by, well, the decades that it does. Because picking cotton with unfree labor becomes that much more profitable. Slavery is not incidental, it's integral to the development of the Industrial Revolution. It, a machine such as the spinning jenny is, is, was extremely large. Gradual developments within textile manufacturing eventually allow not only one to bring these machines into one's home, but to expand them into great factories. First called manufactories, and now called factories. Giant textile mills with steam-driven equipment that would be able to produce textiles in particular at a rate previously unheard of. I have some numbers for you to illustrate this. The absolute value of the pounds listed on this chart are less important than the change over time. And I actually am unsure uh, uh, of their value in today's uh, numbers. But think about this. Between 1760 and 1800, British exports in textiles grow from 250,000 pounds to 5 million pounds. To 5 million pounds. They go from importing 2.5 million pounds in 1760 to 366 million pounds of cotton in 1837. This is exponential growth. It is hard to understate what is happening here. That Britain's economy is so is expanding at such a rapid rate we can barely measure it. This has real effects on ordinary people's lives, not just those who own these textiles. For the first time in the history of Great Britain, really maybe the history ever, ordinary people could afford to buy clothing that in previous decades only the wealthy could afford. This includes sheets, right, washable sheets, linens, curtains, and underwear, right? Prior to this, you wore wool underwear, if you wore any at all. Now you can afford cotton. Now you're going to afford cotton. Excuse me. These transformations, as I'll get to in a, more, a little bit more detail in a moment, um, provoke strong debates within Great Britain. The, the, the speed at which this is occurring prevented the government from really understanding precisely what was happening. Little regulation was imposed until the 1830s, and many of these textile workers were, as you can see from the slide, women and children. Uh, they comprise two-thirds of the textile workforce in the first third of the 19th century, some of whom worked from the hours of 3 a.m. to 10 p.m. Injury was quite common. This was hard work. You could get your fingers stuck in the machines, uh, lose an arm, uh, lose a finger, uh, and therefore not be able to work ever again. Uh, it was only in the 1830s that Parliament begins to investigate these conditions. Um, obviously, the Industrial Revolution is not limited to the textile industry. It also involved developments in um, uh, power. So the steam engine the, and the importance of the steam engine is hard to underestimate. Not only was it used within the, the new textile mills themselves, but also to power the most important, I would argue, invention of the Industrial Revolution, the railroad. And indeed, you can measure the emergence of the railroad 
uh, you can track, excuse me, the emergence of the railroad. Uh, uh, excuse me. The emergence of the railroad complements the emergence of industrialization. So if you look at this chart, which showed, uh, demonstrates the emergence of railroad production in, the, in these countries, it also shows you the emergence of industrialization in these countries as well. So yellow is Great Britain, blue is Germany, um, France is green. As Britain expands in the early 19th century, it gradually gets smaller and smaller, and Germany gets bigger and bigger. And that is, in fact, how industrialization continues. You can see another slide uh, that illustrates this point uh, as well. Once industrialization emerges in Great Britain, it expands elsewhere. Germany, France, uh, Austria, and then you can see the United States enter the picture as well. Um, I'm not going into why industrialization expands out of Britain uh, in this class, but happy to answer questions on that uh, over email or in office hours. Because what I want to conclude this introduction to the Industrial Revolution is, uh, is on the social consequences of industrial, uh, industrialization. The growth of the British economy and the new relationships that emerged between those who participated in it, in it gave rise to a new system of social classes. So if you think back to my um, lecture on the French Revolution, I described the three estates, nobility, clergy, and everyone else. Those estates were based on uh, birth. To what estate were you born into? And the third estate included all kinds of people. Merchants, uh, uh, bankers, workers, etc., etc. Now, we're going to have a new kind of social system, one based not on to whom you were born, but on what you do, on what you do physically. Are you a worker who uses his hands, or are you an investor who controls capital? And it's the divide between those two fundamental groups that in many respects provides the engine for a great deal of the conflict that will define uh, both Western and global societies going forward. So those who own capital, or those who at least don't work with their hands, are the new middle classes, uh, pictured here in the 19th century. The middle class prides itself on its uh, coherence, in its uh, uh, um, focus on family life, which is in the image. They want to display their wealth and their growth in the context of industrialization. They, can, they begin to increasingly use individual homes as a place to display their success. And they begin to build cultural institutions where they can display their values. And they define themselves largely against that of the working classes. And so while, yes, there were workers before this, it is only with industrialization where one can speak of something called class consciousness where both middle class and, and working class begin to define themselves based on their relationship to the economy. Workers had a hard life. Their, their wages were low. So low, in fact, that unlike the middle classes, their wives usually had to work as well. So the image of the stay-at-home mom is one that was not broadly Shared. The working class were more public. They didn't have these nice private houses. They had um, tenements, or they had apartments. They lived a life that was fundamentally different than that of the working class. And that created a new kind of understanding of who they were as people. So think of my third, the third part of my definition, the way in which industrialization changes our relationship to one another, our, the way we experience our relation to the economy. The Industrial Revolution, by creating these new kinds of classes, these new social categorizations, created new forms of consciousness, new ways of understanding one another, based on one's experience of work or lack thereof. And that fundamentally creates a new problem that will face world's, uh, Western society really until this today. The notion of class conflict. 
The idea that by virtue of my place in the economy, that my place in the economy defines who I am, that gives me a, con a, a, a sense of, of my place in society, that then gives rise to oppositions and to questions about the givenness and the, natural, the naturalness and the, the justice of these relationships in the first place. Eventually, those here, down in the working class, who are suffering due to the Industrial Revolution, to the Industrial Revolution who have not benefited by, from the Industrial Revolution, will question why all the benefits seem to be going up here. And that is due fundamentally to the ways in which industrialization created new notions of our relationships, not simply to the economy, but to one another. That the forms of inequality that emerged in the wake of industrialization, despite the fact that everyone eventually would do better, created the conflicts that would define Western society going forward. And so on Thursday, I'm going to address the ways in which those conflicts took place internationally, and then Dr. Haynes, a week from today, will return to Europe to show how they uh, uh, emerged um, within European society itself. So, good luck uh, writing those uh, uh, short essays and responding to your discussion posts, and we'll see you on Thursday.